My name is Lulu. I'm the founder and CEO of Elix, and we are honored to host this important conversation tonight on reproductive justice. Elix is the first to personalize proven herbal remedies for hormonal health, and part of our mission is really to bring these painful private conversations public so that we can enable her to be her own best health advocate in the doctor's office and in life. And so tonight, really honored to introduce Dr. Deirdre Owens, acclaimed historian and professor and author of one of my favorite books, Medical Bondage, which really gives credit to the role of black, black and immigrant women's bodies in the founding of American Gynecology. Before I turn it over to Deirdre, would love to also introduce Linda Blount, the president of the Black Women's Health Imperative, which is the only national organization dedicated to advancing the health and wellness of our nation's 21 million Black women and girls, physically, emotionally, and financially. Last but not least is Bea Dixon, founder and CEO of Honeypot, which is the first complete feminine care system that cleanses, protects, and balances your vagina. So Deirdre, before we could talk about the broken state of the state of women's health and what we can do to advance equality, could you please give us some context to how we got to where we are and what is really the untold history of American gynecology? One person, what were the structures or the systems already in place that allowed James Marion Sims to continue to do the kind of work he did on enslaved women? And then when he moves to New York, poor Irish immigrant women. Right. And so that's where I come in, because I want people to see that medical racism didn't just happen with the Tuskegee syphilis experience, uh, experiment or Henrietta Lacks right in the 20th century. But the, this had existed since the colonial era. And so those structures were steadily being put in place. And so here we now are in the 21st century. Right. Having a conversation around reproductive health and justice and injustice. And it literally is unfortunately unbroken in terms of those systems that are being in place. So when you have doctors today who don't believe black people experience pain, or if they do, it's very minimal, that uh, black women are the cause of high maternal morbidity rates and infant mortality because they eat too much fast food and, and they're too overweight and all of those kinds of things. You can open up 18th, 19th, 17th century medical journals and literally find the same kind of patient blaming. The fact that, and this is for all women, oh, women don't experience pain in the upper vaginal area because they don't have a lot of nerve endings. I actually had an OBGYN tell that to me when I was a fellow at the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists. And this was a working physician, a working OBGYN. So when you have all of these reports that come out, in the 21st century from places like UVA and University of Chicago and those kinds of places stating that many of their residents and doctors and students still have beliefs about alleged black and white biological difference. They don't just get it because their parents are bigoted. Now, sometimes they get it because their parents are bigoted, but there's a larger history in the textbooks and what they've been taught or not taught that stem back centuries. And so what I aim to do in my, in my work is really tell this, this history in a way that's accessible, but also in a way where we can start to change curriculum design. We can have everybody on the same page, activists, entrepreneurs, artists, right, doing this thing to dismantle or the important work of dismantling medical racism because it's a public health crisis. And I'll end here by dedicating this to the memory of Shah Asia Washington, and there is another young black woman who just died, she and her, her child. Um, so another maternal morbidity, infant mortality rate. Please forgive me, someone can put her name in. I think it's Thea, but she was a YouTube influencer, 24 years old, shot Asia 26. I dedicate this to their memory. Deirdre, it's heartbreaking. And um, for anyone who wants to learn more about the history, we'll put this in the notes, but um, Deirdre's book, um, Medical Bondage, go in, goes into much more detail on, on the history and the things that we weren't taught in American history class or in sex ed that really are such an important foundational part of the state of the state. And Deirdre, you mentioned this, um, but Linda, turning it over to you, um, could you elaborate more on what 
Deirdre spoke about in terms of the state of the state and really how um, how what we've experienced as systemic and institutional problems within the founding of this country dating back to colonial times still impact women's access to care today. Yeah, well, thank you, Lulu, and it's good to be here. And, and uh, Deirdre, you know, put it brilliantly. Um, the, the, the sad thing is, I, I wish I could say that what Deirdre said was over, but it's not. There are still doctors today who believe that black and brown people have thicker skin and therefore don't feel as much pain as white people. Um, you know, this opioid issue has been in, in the, the news quite a bit. Um, there was an, art, an article written recently that said, oh, black people were spared the opioid crisis because they weren't getting opioids prescribed in the emergency department. Well, what that meant was they weren't getting opioids prescribed when they needed them because physicians thought they were there for drug seeking purposes. And we, we see this narrative played out throughout medicine. Uh, you know, black women and HIV, there's a drug that prevents the transmission of HIV. Black women are much less likely to get it prescribed because medical students feel like, and this has been documented, that by prescribing PrEP, it's going to encourage black women to engage in riskier sexual behavior. So this hypersexual narrative that stems from all of the gynecologic catastrophes and, and abominations that, that Deirdre describes in her book, you know, this, this comes from believing that black women are this just sexual being and therefore only good to develop, to, to produce children. Although if we fast forward to Hyde and Helms, they don't even think black women should have children. So, so we've kind of, you know, come 180 degrees. And, and what we see in maternal health, um, as you know, Deirdre just tragically pointed out, but we've got just too many examples. A woman in labor, a woman postpartum, when she complains of not feeling well, is not likely to be listened to, not likely to be believed in many cases. And that stems from you know, the colonialism and, and the, the you know, tragedies that, that Deirdre talked about, but also you know, this Reagan administration model myth of the welfare queen. I mean, all of these things are connected and inform the way medicine is, is practiced. And we see this, you know, in, among white doctors, but also doctors coming from other countries who have been, who've been trained outside the U.S. because their perception of black and brown people is shaped by the media and news they consume in their countries. Mm -hmm. And so now we're seeing this play out um, that, that, you know, black women in particular are more likely to have not only uterine fibroid tumors and endometriosis, but more serious tumors. And, but because of all of this, we have, we've been conditioned to live with the pain. I, I can't tell you how many women I've talked to whose mothers said, you know, this is just part of your period. This is a part of being a woman. You just have to suck it up. And so many women suffer and bleed heavily. It, we even see in this country, young women in high school missing days from school because they have uncontrolled bleeding and or may not even be able to afford the menstrual products to deal with their bleeding and it's enough to derail their education. I mean, we see in Atlanta in some schools, young women miss a month out of the school year, which is enough to keep them from graduating. Right. And so we add on top of all this, emotional health, Mm -hmm. You know, the, the constant battle with periods, we, we did a, a session at Spelman where women talked about their periods and the amount of trauma associated with periods is staggering. And while we're conditioned to, to sort of believe, well, black people have lower rates of depression and suicide, we're seeing something very different play out now. Postpartum depression, not likely to be diagnosed in black women. And add on top of that, the, the, what psychologists are now seeing is PTSD resulting from seeing the violent videos of police brutality. It is, it's enough to make your, your head explode. And then we add COVID-19 on top of all of that, where women are reluctant to go to the doctor for prenatal care. They're reluctant. They don't know what's going to happen when they go into labor and have to go to the hospital. They're afraid. Chronic disease rates are, are likely to both increase and management decrease because people are afraid to go to the doctor. And 
again, part of COVID-19, people have lost health insurance. They've lost their jobs. They've lost health insurance. So of course they're not going to go to the doctor because they can't afford it. So for 400 years, black women have lived at the intersection of racism, classism, and gender discrimination. And this gets played out in our health and our disease state and our emotional health every single day. Yeah, it, it's staggering that in the U.S., um, the rate of antidepressant prescription for women has increased 250 percent in recent years. And what you were speaking about, the constant battle with periods, that's part of why we founded Alex. Um, there's a story of one young woman from Baton Rouge, Louisiana, um, who said that she her periods were so she's a senior in college she's working on her thesis and her periods were and she's a young black woman just so passionate about studying actually um political equality and um, one of her professors noticed that she was constantly missing exams because the ex exams happened on a monthly cycle and her periods were on the same monthly cycle and so he actually he told her the next time you miss class you're going to have to bring a doctor's note or i'm going to fail you because he suspected that she was doing it intentionally mm -hmm. and, and she just she had you know pmdd and all of these issues and in our Alix community, we see that 15 to 20% of women come to us because, and they have fibroids, 30 to 40% of our users have endometriosis, PCOS, or PMDD. And it, it seems like within our current healthcare system, there is the 58% of people who are prescribed birth control to manage a menstrual related issue, or there's the 500 to 700,000 hysterectomies performed annually. And it's estimated that about 25% of those hysterectomies may have been unnecessary. So that's like, total, right, a 5 million hysterectomies that potentially didn't need to happen. But because we, and you know, something that I'm actually really curious about now that we're talking about this topic, Deirdre and Linda, is do we, do you feel that because the history of American gynecology is so based on these surgical advancements, that's kind of what led this tiny unknown colony to move to the global forefront of women's health, that that's part of why our healthcare system, especially as it applies to women's health, is so based on surgical interventions. It's almost like we don't, we, we start with like, you know, here's, here's like birth control or maybe like one other two prescription things. And then it's like, we, we take the leap. Like, I, I'm just, I'm curious about that. I'm curious why our um, rate of C-sections and other operations far surpass that of other developed nations. I have two words. So it was male doctors who inserted themselves into this professional field, saw women's natural functions as pathological. Mm -hmm. So if you are a walking pathology, you have to be fixed. Right. So even in terms of giving birth, what makes sense? Women were squatting, women were helping each other so that there could be an easier, you know, flow with the child coming out, right? All of a sudden, you have to sit on your back with your knees up, and your now your 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 genital area is facing the doctor that for his ease. Yeah. And so, a it's a a kind of pathologizing of women's natural functions. Mm -hmm. So the only time m these men are writing about it is when something's wrong. When most of the births, right, you weren't having all of those those kinds of of emergencies. So they're entering into something when there's an emergency happening, and that's the exception, not the rule. Number two, it's, I mean, even before the U.S. becomes a capitalist nation, it's a proto-capitalist nation. So you can modify everything. So if we could go back to Sims very quickly, all of a sudden, Sims doesn't put people in a lithotomy position. He names it the Sims position. He doesn't say I'm using a duckbill speculum. It's the Sims speculum. And so there's a commodification of everything. And so all of a sudden with the fact that business, birth control, birthing becomes a big business, right? Um, all of a sudden in the 19th century, physicians are entrepreneurs. And there's nothing wrong with being an entrepreneur, but you are essentially commodifying people's sickness, right? Um, and the Hippocratic Oath even tells you you're not supposed to do that. You know, I'm not an MD, I'm only a PhD, but I do know how to read. So I'm, I'm saying the Hippocratic Oath tells you a thing and you've totally worked against that. So for me, that's the kind of, you know, simplification of just pathology and commodification or the kind of business of seeing these bodies as broken and needing to be surgically fixed. 
and there is a huge financial incentive. You can prescribe birth control or you can remove the organ. One pays a whole lot more than the other. And, and this is not to say that some hysterectomies are not necessary, but we have enough data to know that a significant percentage of hysterectomies are not medically indicated. They are done for the provider's convenience and, and for his or her financial gain. It's, it's just, it's shocking to me. Um, and Bia, I see you um, shaking your head I'm at, just, I'm just. <laughs> at all of this as well. And, you know, you founded the honeypot in response to some of these failures of modern healthcare system and your own search for a natural solution. Um, and, right. you know, we at Alix are just so grateful to trailblazers like you who have really destigmatized the category of we need better solutions to help women with something that's natural, all menstruators, to help with something that's naturally reoccurring on a monthly basis. And so can, right. you, can you share a bit more about your entrepreneurial journey and really kind of what led you to what, you're, what you've been working on? You know, honestly, I feel like my um, I feel like this business was gifted to me from my from my grandmother. Um, what you have to understand there, though, is that my grandmother has been dead since my mother was eight years old. So um, you know, me and me and my brother were gifted this from our ancestors. Um, and the reason why I say that is because I had uh, bacterial vaginosis for almost a year, and um, you know, I couldn't, I just couldn't figure it out. I couldn't figure out what was going on, you know, and I'm, you know, I wanted to go to school to be a doctor, you know, like I, I have been a natural healer probably all my life, you know? And so, you know, so for me, it, it, it was, it was terrible. You know, I, I, I didn't know what to do. And, um, and so one, one day, you know, kind of in the morning, right before I woke up, I had a dream with my grandmother. And in the dream, she uh, handed me a piece of paper and she told me that this was going to get rid of my problem. And, but she kept saying, you have to remember, you have to remember, like you need to read the paper. Remember, remember, because you're in a dream. Like this isn't, this is real, but you're not, you're not in your dimension. You're in mine. Like this shit's about to go away. So you need to remember, like read the paper. Don't look at me, read the paper, you know? And then I remember her telling me to wake up and I woke up and um, I, I, at that time, cause I had just initiated into Santeria Lukumi, which is a, a Afro-Cuban religion um, or spirituality. So I kept a book by my bed cause I was dreaming a lot, you know? And, um, and I, I woke up and I wrote it down and I remembered everything that was on the paper. And within a couple of days I made it and it worked. And so, you know, it, for me, it was like a no brainer. It was like, oh, I have to like, it was immediately like, oh, I need to make this into a business, you know, because there's so many women that are going through this thing, right? And whether that thing is a yeast infection that's reoccurring or bacterial vaginosis that's reoccurring or a UTI that's reoccurring or irritation or odor or sensitivity, not that honey pot is going, I can't claim that it cures those things, right? Um, but, but at least it can help you to keep your pH where it needs to be, <laughs> right? At least it's clean, at least it's effective. Um, and so that's when, you know, I kind of did my own form of a clinical trial. I, you know, I gave it away to hundreds of women for years, for almost two years, because I wanted to make sure that it wasn't just me, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, and a lot of those women were seeing the same results. Some of those women didn't have anything going on, right? Like our products aren't just for women who have problems. Our, 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 our products are really like just clean, effective products that can help you to be proactive about your vulva and vaginal health. Um, so that's really how, how we've gotten, how we got started. Then we were just a wash company, you know, now, um, we're, we're a vagina company. You know, we, that's why we call ourselves the honeypot company, you know? Um, and, and I'm, I'm grateful to, to be on here with, um, with Linda and Deirdre, like, um, Deirdre, I'm like buying your 
I'm like buying your book like the moment Thank you. <laughs> that we that we finish. Like, is it on audiobook? Like, what do I need to do? <laughs> like, like what? Like you just like some of the things you said I knew. Um, you know, it, it's it's funny how humans can just fuck something up terribly. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, it, it's it's crazy how our egos can just construct ideas. And and terrible things like that yeah. can happen, you know. So I, I, it feels weird to even talk about my company and how we got started um, with you and Linda here discussing, um, you know, what's going on in our world around us. I'm I'm grateful to be here though. Um, one of the, the the themes, I guess, I'm seeing between um, Deirdre, your work about the history and Bia, what you just shared about the honeypot, is really this notion of, you know, these, um, of Marion Sims and other doctors like him back in the day, how they took normal female functions and made them problems. Mm-hmm. Um, and Bia, a lot of what you're saying is going back to natural solutions like let's offer solutions that help keep women well um versus having our bodies be seen as something that really needs fixing uh and what you said about your grandma actually so my grandfather ran a hospital in china and it was the hospital i was born into and one of the concepts in traditional chinese medicine uh, back in the ancient days was you only pay doctors to keep you well so the second right. you actually got sick, you stopped paying your doctor. I mean, right. imagine how differently our world would look today, like literally today, right in this moment, right. during COVID, if right. our entire healthcare system was built on keeping all of to us- To be proactive. Back, right, to be proactive and to stay well versus fixing or creating problems to, that needed fixing. And then- and then make you feel dirty for ordinary problems. Vaginas are ordinary. I am so tired of hearing about how it's a taboo subject. How is, how is it that half the planet is here from a penis and a vagina? And that is taboo, right? How is a yeast infection taboo? How is a bacterial infection taboo? How are any of the, these things, fibroids, and these things have been happening since the beginning of time, right? Mm-hmm. Since the beginning of humans, had to be, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, so it, it's, it's crazy that our systems are set up the way that they are, which, which makes my work and Deirdre's work and your work and, and, and Linda's work, it makes it so necessary because we have to be responsible um to to show people that like there's nothing wrong with if no matter what your situation is if you have aids if you have covid if you have mal- whatever it is it's ordinary right Th- these are just things that happen in our world you know so it's you know i'm i'm happy to be here i'm happy to be a proactive solution um with our brand and you know, it's 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 been a really beautiful experience. On the topic of proactive solution, we're getting a lot of audience questions. So please continue to chat questions. Um, the RVD team is here helping us field them. So one of the questions from our audience is, what can allies do in their own conversations with doctors in and out of the exam room to continue to advocate for the equity in care for black women? And I think, Linda, this is a lot of work that the um, BWHI has done, both from a legislative perspective, from tools and resources and programs for the community, and from just reforming our, um, a lot of our healthcare institutions. Yeah, you know, language is really important. Um, I think we, we all know that. And how we talk about data and race needs to change. How we talk about illness and race needs to change. Because what happens is we end up blaming that person. You know, I can't tell you how many times I've heard, well, if they would only just 
then they wouldn't have. And it's like, you, you do know that that they you're talking about is, is me, you know, it, it's not that. Um, but, but people don't think, people in my field in epidemiology, we do a terrible job of talking about data and race because we lead people to believe it's their fault. There's no biologic or genetic determinant for race, therefore it, it can't be because somebody's black or, or brown. But in, in, to answer the question about allyship, I mean, the response we, that typically is given is when somebody says something, say something, but be mindful of, of yourself and how you are using language. Think about it first. You know, am I, is, is what I'm thinking really conveying what I mean? Because if you talk to any researcher or physician, you know, nurse, they'll say, well, that's not what I meant. Like, I, I understand that's not what you meant, but that's what you said. So this is an opportunity now to stop and think about what you mean and what you say to make sure there's congruence between the two and read what people are writing. Read what thoughtful people in the health equity and health disparities space, those researchers and, and sociologists are saying and, and pay attention to how they use words and, and how they describe the issues so that you can understand and make sure that you're not communicating any Thing in any way that might lead your listener to believe that you're blaming the person or holding somehow a black and brown person res responsible for health disparities. You know, when, mm -hmm. we, when COVID-19 started, there was this, oh, black people and brown people don't get COVID-19. And then there was this shift of, oh, look, black and brown people are getting COVID-19. And I will tell you for some people, at that moment, COVID-19 ceased being a problem. Oh, well, that's just black and brown people, so we don't need to worry about it. Um, and and it, it reflects how language is used. And if you look at how media covered COVID-19 from February to July, there is a huge difference. Yeah. It was a change that happened in mid-late um, April, and suddenly the way we talked about it was very different. Yeah. And so we do need to be careful about how we're using language and what we're actually communicating. And what um, are the most urgent agenda items at BWHI and how can people get involved? Well, we, uh, we are in, in that space. We are actually developing curricula for anti-racism for providers. So to help physicians, nurses, but even like med tech folks, people who interact with patients understand how, what they are bringing to that interaction. So that will be available online. And on our website, coronavirus.bwhi.org, there's a whole host of resources that black and brown women in particular can take advantage of. We have a weekly TV series, Black and Well TV, where we, that came out of the need to make sure that we got accurate and timely information into the hands of black women and their families. Because, you know, be and, and Deidre know, if, if we tell black women, then their friends and families will know, then their communities will grow stronger. And so we try to make sure that every week we bring something else that's, that's actionable and, and useful. And for example, this week, we're gonna be talking about what does school reopening mean? Mm -hmm. What should we do? Those of us who have school age kids or kids in college. So we try to give, try to take the, the research, translate it into something that's meaningful and actionable that women can use in their day-to-day -day lives. And all of our work, whether it's chronic disease prevention um, and risk reduction, maternal health, the reproductive justice work we do starts with an asset frame that women are not broke, black women are not broken, broke down. We understand our health. We are actively involved in our health. We come to our lives from a position of strength and asset. And it's through that lens that we, that we approach our programmatic work. We've invested over $15 million in community work since I've been on board and our policy work. Yeah. I would say, can, can I just say something real quick? And I'm going to be quick. Linda, that was so beautifully said. I hope you guys heard. Thank you. What she just said, be responsible with your words. Be responsible for the words that you hear and how you accept them. Wow. Oh, I'm so honored to be here. I'm so grateful to meet you ladies. Thank you. Thank you. I was going to say, and I mean, it's not, it, this is not to add, this is literally just to, to extend because I think, um, you know, like B 
Linda laid it all out for us. I, I come from, and this is not a professorial uh, response to the ally question that was asked by um, a, a viewer, but really from a personal standpoint. So for 20 years of my life, I have been coupled, I've been partnered, I've been married to a man. I see one of my Bennett sisters on here, Angeline Gordon, who has seen him. Um, he, he handsome, but he's the whitest looking black man you want to see. I mean, he is white looking. We are a faux interracial couple. And because on paper, we're both black. We met at Clark Atlanta University in a master's program in the 90s when Atlanta was known as the new black Mecca studying African-American history. And yet we look so different because he has a white mom who he looks exactly like and a black dad. And so, you know, here I am without the braids. I have, you know, big Afro and, and broad features and dark skin. And so I'm visibly black. And he shared a story with me today. He had to go to the DMV. He just moved from Brooklyn to join me in, in Lincoln, Nebraska. And in Nebraska, there is a law that states that the uh, shepherdy, uh, no, sorry, deputy sheriff has to come outside to look at like the car and the title and all of this stuff. Long story short, because my husband is a white appearing person, this man was comfortable. And he said, oh my goodness, from New York, it's a beautiful state, but the government is, his words, not my, the government's just fucked up. And I said, well, you know, he'd never say that to me because as a visibly black person, he would make an assumption that perhaps we had different political ideologies or sets of beliefs. And so I asked my husband, who is not as confrontational as I am in terms of calling people out, I said, well, what you say? Well, I didn't want to say anything because he's a deputy. I said, dude, you look white. He wasn't going to reach for the gun and get you. And I don't say that in jest. You look like a tall, big white man. And as it, because that's the body that you're housed in, Nobody's saying have arguments, but you could have said, well, you know, why don't we not talk politics? Because I, I feel differently. I love the, the progressive government of my state. Mm -hmm. I said, and you could have just said something like that to allow him space to maybe question the next time he feels so free to give an unwanted and unwarranted and unasked for opinion. And, and inaccurate. Yeah, and so even in terms of the family situation, his mom married a black man until he died, had three, you know, legally at the time when they were born. It wasn't no biracial or, or, or any of that, no other foreign to check off in the early 70s. And she would act to me in a way that was, you know, doing job talk. And I had to say, um, so no one's spoken like that since the 70s. And that was typically on the Jeffersons and good times. Like this is the 21st century and I don't say what's happening in dynamite and all of that kind of stuff. Just speak to me in the way that you would speak to anybody. We're both American. We both speak English as a first language. So trust me, I'm gonna understand your words. Like you don't have to do jive talk with me or ask me only black things. Cause I promise you being born in this country I've been exposed to a lot of things, right? And so those are the kinds of ways that when you bring that to them Often, people who are really uncomfortable and, and sensitive then say, oh my gosh, she's playing a race card. But I wasn't the one who brought it up. You were the one who started treating me differently, yeah. even without you knowing it. And so for me, being in this situation, but also being someone who studies and writes and teaches about race and racism, I tend to say I have a really intimate view. Not that it's, it's necessarily better, but most Black people aren't coupled with Black folk who look white. And so we often don't see how white people treat other white people because we don't look white because we're not white. And I can tell you there is a difference. There is a stark difference. And so I would say white people need to first listen to each other because they typically don't listen to people who look differently than them. So listen to each other and get the most progressive person, the most in your face person who's not gonna have the calculated risks as me or Lulu or, or Linda or B and have that person go out as best they can to not harm themselves, to really call into account those racist comments, those bigoted comments, those xenophobic comments, those transphobic comments. Though, you know, I, I could go down the line, those ableist comments. You get that person, because they'll listen to them before they will me. And I've got a whole PhD and a book, and they won't listen to me. Right. right. 
Adira, what I thought was so powerful when we first met, I think it was back in 2016, uh, was after you shared some of the findings from your book, because again, we're just barely scratching the surface here. Um, you went into your own experience. Oh, with, yeah, yeah. You, you know what I'm talking, referring to. With IVF, um, in, vitro, uh, in vitro fertilization. Yeah, in New York. On the Park upper Avenue. On the, yeah, on the Upper East Side. Um, and I didn't know what a, a cervical dilation was for someone who wasn't pregnant because I had only read about it, heard about it um, from people who, birthing people who gave birth to babies. So I had no clue. Um, I was essentially diagnosed as not having an uh, opening in my cervix. So it's called cervical stenosis. Mm. So I was told, oh, with cervical stenosis, because you still have a lot of eggs, they're good quality. I don't have any health conditions, diseases, you know, anything. Okay, this, this should help. So I was told to take two Midol before I came to the doctor's office. Now, I don't know anything about this. Everybody I've talked to said, oh, when I was 10 centimeters or blah, 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 you know, the baby was coming. I, I'm not pregnant, I'm not giving birth. So I go in, had taken the two Midol and just like a, a pelvic exam or pap smear, you're lying back on the table. The doctor opens, tells you to open your legs, put your feet in the, in the straps, takes that duck bill speculum, inserts it, and then also puts his hand in so he can hold my cervix, and pull it towards him. And then I see a long metal rod with a brush. And for 15 minutes, he bores a hole into my cervix. It was the worst pain I had ever experienced. And here I was writing a book about the experiences of enslaved women. And I'm screaming, screaming. There was a white nurse and the look she gave me was that I was being histrionic. Mm -hmm. And I remember after he finished, he said, well, I, I didn't know it would be so painful. You took the mite all right. So I, I'm, like I said, I write about dead people because I'm a historian, I'm not an MD. So I don't know what these procedures are like. I only read about these procedures. And so I said, I took the mite all. Number one, somehow it must've been my fault that I experienced so much pain because I didn't, he assumed I didn't take the two mite all. I didn't pay attention to him. Patient blaming or. Yeah, right. But in, so now I can say that, you know, four years later, but then I, I'm thinking, well, maybe I should have taken a higher dosage or, you know, what's going on. And I then was told to keep my legs up for 15 minutes. They left the room. So they never came back because I was to go to another hospital, like across the street. So I had to find products to clean me and get rid of the gown and try and scoot over so I could get my cell phone to, to time 15 minutes. Not one person came in to this Park Avenue, this very exclusive fertility specialist office to say, how are you? Um, so I had to and, and it's not that I'm trying to be graphic, but it's, it's true. I had to find towel, like paper towels and get the water hot enough to take the congealed blood off of my and, and dead flesh, uh, you know, the, the, the flesh off of me because he bore a hole. So the flesh came out. I had to find a pad because I was bleeding and then walk another five to seven minutes to the hospital so I could then get the HSG which is another diagnostic test where you insert iodine or dye to see if there's something wrong. My body was so inflamed and swollen in that period of time that he could not insert the, the instrument for the dye. As I sat on the bed, there was a black nurse and this was a larger room. And I remember I didn't say a word and she did the very thing that had not been done. She simply empathized. She started to talk to me. She rubbed my head. She said, you can hold my hand. She bent down, you know, I had IVF. That's how I had my, my babies. It'll be okay. I know it's painful. She's talking to me. Well, what do you do? Because they always say, what do you do? I said, you'll think this is funny. I'm a professor. I'm writing a book on the history of American gynecology. And she said to me, I cannot remember her name, but I thank her. I always tell this story. It's in the, in the afterword of my book. She said, you're going to put this in there, right? And I said, no, 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 I'm a historian. I have to remain objective. It's about 
historical actors. And she said, girl, you better put this in here. And it was the only section of my book that my editors told me not to, to revise or edit. And so he did it again a few weeks later without telling me. Needless to say, this was not the fertility specialist or office that I stayed with. But here I was with all the markers of respectability, married, check, highly educated, check, lived in this cosmopolitan city, check, had good enough health insurance that I could go to this, this office, to one of New York City's best, check. I had all of this, and yet there were certain assumptions that he made about my body and what I could withstand. And I didn't know at the time that that there was something wrong because you're not, as you're in the moment, you're not concentrating on all of the historical or political stuff. You're just trying to figure out if you can get pregnant and have a, have a baby. And so it was only until the book was written and I started to speak to people outside of academic audiences where people would share their stories. And I saw, I, I learned, oh my God, I wasn't, I wasn't exceptional at all. This happens to, to so many different women so many different women. Yeah. Deirdre, you're that just, I mean, thank you so much for, for sharing um, such a horrible experience that just give me the chills. And we got a couple of questions from the audience. Um, one is how do we best honor the black women who have contributed to the field of gynecology while also acknowledging their pain? And then two, uh, I guess this is for all of the panelists, uh, in addition to your book, Medical Bondage, what should be on our reading list to dig into the history further and what more can we do um, in this fight for reproductive justice? Dorothy Roberts, anything by her? Anything, anything. By her. anything. Donna Harriet Washington. Yes, Harriet Washington, medical apartheid. Di, Di, her name is not pronounced the way it's spelled, so I'm going to spell it. Donna Ayeen Davis, D-A-N-A -A hyphen A-I-N Davis. She has a book called Reproductive Injustice. Mm -hmm. Amazing, amazing books. They are doing amazing work. I'm going to just say, and then I'm, I'm hushing because I can talk a lot. Buy Honeypot products. Let me tell you, I already have folk asking me, B, can you tell her that they don't sell it in Mississippi? Because I used to teach her. <laughs> can, she, can she get me some bottles? I was, um, it, it doesn't operate this way, y'all. So buy Honeypot products because there is a need. I use them. I continue to use them. Um, Lathan Thomas was the one who first gifted me with it. Yeah, and, uh, and that's I, my boo. Yes, I've been using them, at, like your products, ever since contribute to um, the Black Women's Health Initiative or Imperium. Imperium. Yeah. I, my, uh, my honorarium is going to her. Oh. My honorarium has been contributed to, to the Black Women's Health Imperative. And I say this, I, it, it, I don't have any shame about me. Buy my book and let me tell you why. I had the so only- Buy two. Yes. In the <laughs> academic press world. I specifically chose a black editor, Walter Biggins, at the time who was at University of Georgia Press. The only one, and there are a lot of academic presses. When I won this really prestigious book award, that meant he won. Mm -hmm. And I was just told by the new editor, because Walter has now gone on to an even higher press, but I was just told two days ago that my book has now sold over 6,100 copies. That doesn't mean a lot in the New York Times bestseller world, but most academic texts only sell 300 to 400 copies. Yeah. I'm at 6,100. I need y'all to buy this book so it can go to 10,000 because what that means is they will now know that these kinds of books written about enslaved people, written about the history of medicine, mm -hmm. written about things that are not sexy sell because people are interested in wanting to understand a more nuanced understanding and interpretation of the past. So please purchase those books, Dorothy Roberts, Donna Eileen Davis, Harriet Washington, um, Rebecca Skloots, The Immortal Story, uh, Immortal Life of, of Henrietta Lacks, and Deirdre Cooper Owens, Medical Bondage. And Deirdre Owens. <laughs> and Deirdre Owens. <laughs> By two. And I sit here. <laughs> That's dope. And you know what, you guys, the fact that you just want to is enough, right? 
just just if you if you want to know how to help just think positively come from a place of understanding like like Linda said be responsible with your words give good energy you know if 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 you see something and it's not right don't be afraid to say that that's not right if you see somebody that looks hurt or you see is going through an injustice come in and help them right being human is enough hmm. you know what i mean you can hmm. sure you can be you can join clubs you can yes read books understand know the history know what happened and at the same time just want to be there just want to help just want to give good energy to it that is not something that should be neglected it's actually simple right um Wow. Yeah. I'm actually, so I'm so honored to be here listening to you ladies, man. I wow. And B, on that note, what more do you feel like businesses, especially businesses that are started with a social impact mission, not only, you know, exist for the purpose of profit, but truly genuinely want to create a better future and a brighter world? You know, what mm -hmm. what do you feel like the role of businesses and what more could social impact minded businesses be doing? I mean the role the role of business is I mean honestly it's it's to create wealth right and and it's hard to give back or give to or invest in if you don't have if you don't have the capital to be able to do that right so I think it's important that we understand that business is commerce it's business right um and that and that also um there's nothing wrong with with having wealth right my dream is to sell this company and be so financially stable that anything that I do after I sell this company, I don't need any more money. So everything that I make, I just give away, you know? Um, we're working on our, we, we have, we have you know, we have organizations that we work with like Happy Period. We've worked with Afropads in the past, um, but we're, we're, we're working on developing a social impact that is that is to that is for honeypot like and it took me a while to figure out what that was you know because i didn't want to just be doing some shit just to do it i wanted to do it because i actually really want to do it you know so i think it's important that it, that it comes from a real place mm -hmm. um if, if if you're gonna have a social impact um i think it's important for you to truly care and be passionate about that thing that you're trying to impact because if you don't if you're not passionate about it it's going to be surface level, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and I know that, you know, not that I don't care about the, about the organizations, and I'm just being honest with you guys. It's not that I don't care about happy period. It's not that I don't care about Afropads, right? But those are, the, those are their own organizations. I'm very passionate about um, supplying femin clean feminine care to homeless women. I'm extremely passionate about that, um, you know, but but I think that it's important that it comes from a place, a real, real deep place of passion, you know? And so that's really what's pushed me to want to develop our own internal um, social, social programs of investment um, into communities that don't have access to, to water, don't have access to, um, you know, to, to menstrual products and things of that nature. Um, so I think it's important that you really want to, you know, because if you don't, you're not really going to do it well, you know, yeah. and you shouldn't try to help somebody if you're not going to help them, like if you're not really there to help, you know, yeah. so, yeah. Yeah, and, and Lulu, I would say, you know, to everyone on, on this call, listen and reflect on what Deidre said and what B mm -hmm. said. I mean, really listen you know, feel the passion that they brought, because this is meaningful to them personally. This isn't just something they're doing. This means something. And when you read Deirdre's book, don't just read it and then tell your friends, oh, I read it. Think about what she has on these pages because she is, she is speaking a collective historical pain into a reality that still exists today. This isn't, this isn't history, ancient history. It, this is, contemporary history, to be honest. So when you read the book, think about her words, think of, feel them, 
and have that conversation. And when you think about what Bia said, re reflect on the passion that, that came with those words. Because again, you, you, know, you started about how this is personal to us. It is, it is personal to so many people and it needs to be personal to everyone. Because until it is, we keep having this divide, we keep having these, these disparities, we keep having these inequities, and we keep doing what we are, is happening right now where we've got right. this crisis on our hands that is disproportionately impacting certain people and folks are more than happy, more than willing, readily looking the other way as though it's not happening. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, wow. there's this so is many. America, y'all. <laughs> but, but, but we can raise the vibration as humans we can take responsibility for our health. We can, we can, we can, we can be aware. We can eat well. We can, we can take care of ourselves. We can exercise. We can meditate. We can see a therapist. We can be sad. We can be happy. You can do all of that shit because that's how you take responsibility for yourself. You know, mm -hmm. we we don't have to be. We don't have to be a part of the statistics. We don't even have to believe them, right? You use them as an example so that you can move forward with your life with purpose, with meaning, with caring about yourself. Because when you love yourself, when you like yourself, when you are responsible for yourself, then that goes out to everything else that you do. Because that, that's inside. You can't do something if it's just surface level. You really, really, it has to come from inside of you. You know? Um, thank you. I gotta, I have to jump. I have another panel to go to. I am so grateful. Can I please be connected to Linda and Deirdre, please? Like, Absolutely. Wow. Yeah. Thank you so much. And thank, thank, you. thank you all so much for, I mean, B, I think that, and Linda, that's the, that was the perfect way to end this is really all of the changes, all of the things that need to change that we've talked about really starts at an individual level, um, starts mm -hmm. with us reflecting upon ourselves and our role and our own experiences and then using that as a lens to how do we how do we expand our own mindsets and then those of the people around us and then those of and then having that move forward and having those positive intentions and the desire to create that change um, build that momentum around us so thank you guys so much for joining for this conversation we will definitely share out um, recorded highlights, and also a summary of all of the resources that you mentioned. Again, I want to acknowledge we were just scratching the surface here on this conversation. So hopefully through these powerful, passionate dialogue, it has sparked curiosity to dive deeper into these topics. And we're just really proud to have Deirdre, who shared a wealth of knowledge about topics that we could learn more and dive deeper on. Linda and the Black Women's Health Imperative, which has a wealth of opportunities for you to donate, get involved, and act activism policy and create that real societal and organizational level change. Support the honeypot and shop black owned businesses so that we can create the space for more diversity of different wellness and healthcare organizations to really serve a broader community of needs. I mean, here in the US today, only 4% of healthcare research and development dollars goes to fund women's health in general, um, a stat that we at Elix are very passionate about changing. And on a personal level, I really want to thank Linda because she's connected us with someone who could potentially be a medical advisor on something we really feel passionate about, which is bringing that scientific credibility to the world of natural and holistic healing so that we can really, you know, even though recognizing we are in a broken system, but use the tools of the system to create more alternative solutions um, for many people out there who need them. And continuing to have these important conversations so that we reckon, so that we collectively learn and reflect on and take action on the things that need to change. So thank you so much um, for your time. And we're just so honored um, to have had this conversation. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. Everybody, thank, you. thank you, everyone. Thank you. That was so fantastic. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. That was so enlightening.
Bye, Alicia.